you for joining us this morning for the third and final part in our most recent AI webinar series. With us today is Fraser Davis, AI software engineer at Associate Fulcrum IT Partners company, Fraser. So in this session, we'll be covering application of AI at enterprise level. This will include Fraser running through some specific AI technology types and providing examples of their application. The Q&A function is live as always. We'll be covering the questions at the end. Today, you have an audience with an AI software developer who is currently actively developing AI for organizations at the moment. So I highly recommend taking this opportunity to ask any AI related questions that might come to mind. So Fraser, over to you. Uh, I'm going to start by asking who here has worked with someone who knew a huge amount of things but completely lacked any common sense? I wonder if you can think of someone, maybe you've not worked with them, but you, you know them. Well, uh, you're going to have to get used to uh, interacting with people who know a huge amount but lack any common sense because that's what it's like working with AI. You know, some of compared AI to a omnicompetent idiot. That is someone with a massive skill set, but no idea what to do with it. Um, and today, hopefully, we're, well, today we're going to go through um, a few of the things that uh, might come up as you try to use AI applications um, at the kind of enterprise level and some of the nuts and bolts about how to go about that. The other webinars in this series have been a bit more high level, um, but I'm an engineer, as, as Adam has said, who is actually working on developing AI products for our customers. So um, I'm going to give a little bit of a kind of inside peek into what um, some of the skills and techniques that, uh, that are needed. So, um, I mean, first of all, let's make sure we know what we're talking about. What do we mean by AI? There are, there are two broad categories of AI, um, so-called machine learning and then generative AI. So machine learning, this is um, a bit more like um, kind of some of the software applications that you might be used to, but is using a, an AI model inside. So here you would provide a data set to an algorithm. The algorithm would then generate a model and this model is then able to make predictions or give insights based on that data. And so you can see here, there's a kind of flow that you have some data coming in. The algorithm works to create a model, and then this model provides the insights that you're looking for. This is um, really powerful if you're looking for um, specific insights into business um, or those sorts of things. So if you were to um, come and do the, the TVA AI assessment. This would be something we'd look into, look at the data that that you have and look, oh, is this something that's ripe for machine learning? Is this, you know, if you've got a back catalogue of sales information or, you know, you've got spreadsheets going back um, months and months and months about something that's important to your business, that's perfect for this thing, uh, a perfect thing to give to a machine learning algorithm to create the model, which would then hopefully provide predictive power. On the other side, we've got generative AI. Now, this is different in that it's about generating something novel, something new. And this is kind of where a lot of the hype has been over the last year. Um, so the, the, the main form of generative AI that you might be aware of are so-called large language models. So these are pre-existing models that that exist that have been created by companies like Meta or OpenAI or Anthropic. And that, that, that model sits on a server somewhere and uh, you can make calls to that model and say, um, tell me, you know, give me the text that should come next. If that's not quite clear, we'll go on to a little bit of how this works and the tools that use this as we go on. Um, uh, to start with though, um, I want us to think about this metaphor that um, hopefully will kind of bubble along in the background of this talk, uh, of, of this webinar, and that's of cyborgs and centaurs. So what am I on about here? So a, a cyborg is, I don't know if you like sci-fi or not, but a, a cyborg is a human that's kind of integrated with a robot somehow, um, like a little 
chap on the slide there, you know, he's got like a robotic eye and maybe robotic arms, but he's fundamentally kind of still human. And so the the interaction between the human and the robot in a cyborg is kind of really knit together. So that's one way that you can we can use AI, where the human and the AI are working very, very closely together, a very close feedback loop between what the human is doing and what the AI is doing. And that's kind of one, um, one framework for thinking about how humans can use AI. The other framework we might think about is about a centaur. Now with a centaur, you've got, um, you've still got that mix. Uh, here it's a mix of like a human part and a horse part, but the dividing line is very clear. The top bit's the human and the bottom bit's the horse. Um, and you know, the metaphor is that um, the, in this framework, the human has a very clearly defined role and task that the human does. And then the AI also has a very clearly defined role that the AI does. And there is some interaction between them, but the spheres that they operate in are slightly different. Now, both of these frameworks, thinking about, you know, are we, are we going to be cyborgs or centaurs? Uh, both are good ways of thinking about AI and might be applicable in different scenarios. You know, sometimes we might want to uh, interact with AI in the kind of cyborg framework and sometimes in the, the centaur framework. So just to get you thinking that whenever we're using AI, we want to be thinking about, OK, what's the interaction between the human and the AI here? What's what's going on? Um, I think some of the, the hype that we see in the media, you know, you might see things on Twitter or X where, you know, you've seen, oh, well, ChatGPT is kind of given this like funny poem where it's written um, a recipe in Shakespearean language or whatever it is. Um, and that kind of looks like, oh, it's just the AI going away and doing something, but it's not really a valuable interaction between a human and an AI. But, you know, there are valuable interactions that we can have. And, you know, obviously that's a lot of my work is building systems that, that do that. So as we go along, maybe try and spot, oh, how would this work in a cyborg, cyborg framework? Or how would that work with the, with the Centaur framework? Um, so without further ado, we're going to jump into some of the nuts and bolts of kind of the best practices um, that you will want to engage in if you're thinking of either using some AI tools that already exist, or maybe you're thinking, oh, actually, it'd be good to you know, develop some of our own AI tools, you know, maybe using using a, a software partner um, you know, and some considerations that you'll need to go through to, to start making that assessment. Um, OK, so um, I'm a, a software engineer, software developer, and, and within the software space, we talk about this idea of a single responsibility principle. So this is where you know, I'm typing away writing code, and whenever I'm writing a, a chunk of code, I want to make sure that that chunk just does one thing. It does one thing, it does it well, and it's very clear what that one thing is doing. Now, in software, we do this because it makes it easier to maintain the software and to, to write new things and to build it, um, yeah, build a, the software product bigger and bigger, and to be able to understand what on earth is going on so that if someone else needs to join their team, join the team, they look at this block of code and it's very obvious what it's doing. Oh, it does this one thing, and here is what it does. Um, and, but this single responsibility principle is a very good principle with looking at how to interact with AI, even if you're not a software engineer like me, you know, you're, um, you know whether you're, you're a business leader, whether you're an administrator, whether you're um, yeah, part of a marketing department or things like that. This idea of a single responsibility is a good way of thinking, um, is a good way of thinking through how are you interacting with the AI. So for example, let's say you're using the ChatGPT web browser. So this is um, a tool that you can just sign up for online. You know, you go to OpenAI and sign up for ChatGPT and you get a window prompt and you can have a conversation with one of these large language models. So it's kind of tempting to just kind of throw lots of things at the AI and say, oh, kind of do all this stuff. But if you do that, you're gonna get poor results out of it. So I'm, I'm hoping that a lot of you are using ChatGPT already. It's a very powerful tool. Um, and hopefully, as you bring this single responsibility 
principle into your interactions with it that will help you use it as your um yeah improve how you're using it so let's let's take this example a little bit further so we're using chat gpt we're kind of typing into the chat window and we're trying to build a report for a project you know you're a project manager and there's a report that you need to give to a client and um as i say it can be tempting to just write here are all the details write me the report if you do that you're going to get an okay report back but actually if you think more clearly okay what is the one thing that i want this ai to do in this moment oh i want it to write an introduction okay so chat gpt i would like you to write the introduction here's the information i'd like you to put in it you're going to get a much better output at that point because you're giving it a single responsibility so the ai um has very clear limits of what it's trying to do and um and so it can kind of almost kind of focus on what it's trying to do or let's say you you use notion uh, in your workflows i don't know if um, you will all use notion but i'm i'm assuming that some of you will notion has their uh, ask ai tool um, and this is a really good example of this single responsibility principle it's it's just something that kind of sits within notion there's lots of other things going on but you can just quickly ask oh where's this where's this little bit of information and it can go away and find it or another example so a current project that i finished yesterday um a customer was, was had a huge amount of text that they were wanting to draw insights out of and this text was split over different files and it would have been tempting to just kind of throw the whole thing at an ai and say get me the insights well it's actually the approach that i've uh, that I've taken, which has turned out to be much more powerful, is splitting it down into a number of steps. So there's a step of gathering insight from this file, from this file, from this file, from the, all these different files, and then there's a step of compiling all this information and then drawing the insights at different levels. I hope those examples have helped you understand this idea of a single responsibility principle. You just kind of trying to capture one thing that you want the AI to do and interacting with it um so they can can do that and th this leads on to this idea of composability so um you know ai if it's going to be helpful to any of us if it's going to work within our businesses it needs to slot into processes that we have already it's not just going to come on and like take over your whole admin department it just can't do that at the moment and so thinking about it is this in this kind of single responsibility kind of way, it helps you think, oh, actually it's it's this smaller building block that's part of a larger process that we already have. So, you know, you might be thinking, okay, what are our processes at the moment? If you, if you can think of those in kind of modular ways, that's when you can start to say, oh, actually this whole process is just composed of these different blocks that happen. And actually this block seems to be the one where we can use AI. You know, this, uh, we can't use AI here, we can't use AI here, but in this block we can do. And you can kind of, you know, pull your current process out, uh, kind of plug in an AI workflow and hopefully, um, you know, you know, make things quicker, make things more efficient and all the good things that AI can do, which we'll come on to in a moment. Um, the final thing I'll, on kind of best practices that I'd like us to think about is, retrieval augmented generation now this is like technical language but it refers to um this idea within ai development where the rather than just asking the ai you know when i'm saying ai i'm talking about one of these large language models rather than just asking it oh, what's the next word in this sequence or and just having a conversation with it we can use these models to sort of encode information already and then store that information so this means that then later on when we come to query um, the ai it you know these you can write software that then uses these this stored information within its um within the context that it's giving as it generates its output that's kind of a high level view of what rag is but this is you know we found at razor that this is a really powerful approach because you're able to like preload in lots and lots of information and the low, large language model is able to kind of comprehend this in some way store it kind of in its brain in a way that it can then retrieve things that are similar 
Now, this is a big leap forward from traditional kind of database things, because within a database, if you're wanting to retrieve information from, from a database, you've got to make sure that the the things that you're the information you're retrieving matches exactly what your query is. But the cool thing about large language models is that they're able to encode the meaning of what is said. Now, let's not push the philosophy of quite what I've said there too far, but in some sense, you can capture the meaning of text and then store that meaning somewhere. So that later on, when you come across, um, you know, if there's a query that has the same meaning, all the words might be completely different, but if the meaning of the query is related to this thing that you've already stored, then the, the software tool can, you know, using RAG, is able to pick out that bit of meaning and use that as context for answering the question. This is really powerful. This is where you can get, you know, really bespoke solutions where you can upload your own documentation to something and you can come out with, um, you know, a really tailored answer. Um, so this is something that we've developed at Eraser, an application that uses it. We call it um, Docky, and it uses this idea of retrieval augmented generation. Um, so you, it's also called embedding. So with Docky, what we do is, um, you know, it's a kind of a product that, that you could kind of, that someone could sign up to, and then you can upload as many documents as you want. So this might be for a legal department, and there's a certain case that they're going through. You can upload, Docu um, legal documents to it, and then you can ask questions related to those those documents. And so rather than getting some generic response back, Docky is able to look at that query that you've asked, compare it to all those other documents you've got, and look at the meaning of those documents and the text within those documents, pull in the relevant bits of uh, text from them, and then build an answer to send back to you. And this, this is just one way of using uh, retrieval augmented generation. But as we've seen, it's a very powerful tool. Um, and in fact, it's one we kind of use internally. We use Docket internally because it's kind of helpful with this. Um, we also use it for writing reports. So you can um, upload certain reports and Docky can read those reports and get a style guide from them. So that then when you say, oh, I want to write a report in this style, uh, here are my headings, here's my information, Docky is then able to um, kind of draw all those things together and write reports for us. Once again, this um, this is kind of going back to a single responsibility principle. The way Docky actually writes the reports is, you know, kind of under the hood, it's actually very modular. It does this task and then this task and then this task and then this task. And you know, there's a, a long chain of AI interactions that builds up to get the, the final report that we output. Um, yeah, so hopefully you've, kind of I've piqued your interest a little bit with the, some of the kind of insider insider scoop on um, some of these things. But I'm hoping that this is sparking ideas for you of going, oh, yeah, actually, we, we have this process at work where um, we always get these, uh, these certain files in and we could do with kind of getting certain insights out of them. Or maybe this, you've always got um, a certain format that you need, you know, there's always a certain email that you need to write and you've got to really tailor it. But it's kind of quite templated, but the templates don't quite work. This is the sort of thing where, oh, here's a single responsibility that I could get the AI to do. Um, yeah, just a few ideas. Now, um, some more of those, um, uh, when you're, yeah, some more best practices. Um, I think it can be easy, um, and I've seen this with customers uh, that we've had, to, to see a new technology like large language models, like machine learning, and think, oh, great, this is great, you know, and um, let's dive in, let's do it. And you have no, and then to come out with no idea of if this has actually improved anything. Um, so um, now why can this be particularly hard with AI? So traditional software products is what are what we call determinative. So that means if you give a certain input, you will get a certain output. Whatever you put in, that will always produce the same sort of output. But with AI tools, particularly large language models, the, ans the process is non-determinative. That means if you, are, if you ask a question of an AI and ask the same question, you will get a slightly different answer. You ask the same question again, you'll get a slightly different answer. This means it can be very hard to test 
is this a right answer? Is this a wrong answer? Is this a better answer? Is this a worse answer? Um, so that is a kind of a, uh, a kind of a challenge when approaching the, you know, using AI tools. But now that we know that that's a challenge, hopefully, you know, we can turn that into a bit of an advantage of going, oh, actually, there'll be companies out there that will just jump straight into, oh, yeah, this is AI, and they won't really understand this this part of AI, which is this non-determinative aspect of it. Um, but knowing about the non-determinative side of AI, you know, you're kind of setting yourselves up for success. Now, kind of talking of success, um, in terms of understanding like the success criteria of an AI tool. So let's say you are, um, let's say you're an executive and you're uh, having to write um, a very, a very important email to um, another business, you know, um, you're, um, you know, you've got a very tricky relationship with this other business and you're wanting to challenge them on something. And so you want to use all the tools at your disposal to craft the right kind of email. Now, um, here you might think, oh, actually, I could use a an AI tool to just help me word what I want to say. You know, so you might be using ChatGPT to, to word what it is you're wanting to say. But how do you know that this is the right email that you now need to send? This is a hard question to answer, and it's much easier to answer it if you, before you even approach these AI tools, if you already know what your success criteria are. So this is a problem we've run into in Razor and kind of almost learned it the hard way. When all this stuff kind of started um, really coming to the forefront um, and we were kind of exploring it as it was all very new, um, you know, as one of the developers, it was really easy just going, oh, yeah, let's lose it here, use it here, use it here, use it here. And, oh, well, OK, well, let's tweak this. And oh, is this a better response from the AI? And a lot of the time, it, it was very hard to judge whether it was or not. And so now, you know, that we're a bit more mature with all of this, um, we'll kind of set up, OK, what does a good response look like? What does a bad response look like? And so that, you know, as we're developing these uh, these tools that we use, um, you know, or that we sell, we can track if things are improving or not, or not improving. And so, I, th I think this principle applies more broadly of, of knowing okay, what would a successful engagement with an AI look like. Make sure that that is crystal clear before you start the engagement, because you know, kind of take it from me, um, it can be easy to kind of get um, and kind of trapped by how kind of how powerful these large language models can be. And kind of forget. Oh, actually, there was there was a really clear criteria that I was looking for. So make sure that's that's clear. Um, you know, and there's maybe a slightly side note, but um, you can actually then use a large language model to test whether it's a good output in the first place. Um, so once again, a little kind of insider look into software engineering. If we are developing an AI tool, we'll you know we'll make calls to the AI. We'll get results and then we'll use another ai to query to um to analyze those results and give us feedback on if it's improved or not um but there's no reason that this idea can't be used more broadly you know so let's go back to the example of crafting the, the carefully worded email with the the business um you know with a you've got a kind of slightly tricky business relationship that you're having to bring up a bit of a challenge on you've crafted the email OK, now ask a different large language model. What is the tone of this email? What is it trying to say? Um, you know, what would a, a good re what would a reasonable response to this email be? And there you're using AI to test the AI. Now, if you're you, that might seem like a little bit meta and kind of oh, well, how can you know? As long as you're mixing and matching a few different AI models, um, this can actually be a very powerful way of, of kind of testing. Um, you know, the kind of output that you're getting. Um, but some key, key considerations of, OK, so thanks, Fraser. You've told us here are some best practices of how to engage with AI tools and how to think about maybe using them and maybe even developing some of our own. But um, like, how do I know that this is really a good thing to be doing in the first place? And you've got to ask yourself the question, is there a non-AI way to solve this problem? You know, with any kind of products that you guys will be um, buying, you're going to be wanting to think, oh, this is the problem that we want to solve. And is there a way that AI, we could do this without AI? 
Um, but sometimes the answer will be yes. You know, initially you thought, oh, well, maybe AI is the way to go. And you'll go, actually, there's a better way to solve this with, with a different process, with um, employing someone or, or something like that. But sometimes you'll think, no, well, no, there isn't really a non-AI way to do this, but I'm not sure how to do it. To, to consider if it's an um, if AI is the right way to solve the problem, let's think about some of the cost implications involved. So if you're going to get a, a human to solve this problem, let's say it's constructing a certain kind of um, marketing um, copy, you know, you, you've got a copywriter, you know, creating marketing copy. Um, OK, so you're going to have to employ that person. So you're going to, have to pay their salary and their pension and their national insurance and those sorts of things. AI is not completely free. You do have to pay for the tokens that you're using, but the cost is going to be much, much lower. Uh, you know, with creating the marketing copy, um, humans, unfortunately, were kind of a bit unreliable. We all are, you know, it's just part of our nature. Um, you know, sometimes we get sick, sometimes we have an argument with our kids, you know, sometimes, um, you know, a life event happens, which means we're distracted at work, or we maybe don't even make it to work sometimes. Um, so there's an unreliability and unpredictability there. There is some unpredictability to AI. You know, like we like we discussed already, there's this non-determinative factor, but it's much more controllable than kind of a human in the same situation. The AI doesn't get sick. It doesn't have an argument with its kids. You know, it doesn't have life circumstances. Um, the most that can go wrong with it is, you know, you get a slightly weird output but it's okay there are there are ways around that um and you know you know i've kind of been doing a sort of a playing one against the other but um you do have to be aware that when you are using these ai tools often you are kind of dependent on a you know a large tech company there are ways of doing it where you can self-host a large language model and things but this gets a bit trickier and a bit more expensive and so there is this dependency on someone like OpenAI or, or Meta or uh, yeah, Anthropic who are kind of hosting these tools. And so that would be something you'd need to think through. Um, you've also got to ask yourself, like, is this actually something that an AI could conceivably do? Well, um, what can AI do? Well, um, as I was talking to Adam as we were preparing this, he, was, he said, actually, often a better question is what can AI not do? And I thought, yeah, that's that's a really good question. If we think about what it can't do, that will help us kind of understand the limits. Well, it can't build a house. AI can't build a house. It can't serve a pint. It can't mow your lawn yet. <laughs> um, I guess Boston Dynamics are working on that one. But at the moment, we can't do any of these things. Um, so any kind of physical manipulation of the world, obviously, it can't do this. Any really nuanced um, understanding of text, it can't do. If there's any kind of office politics, it can't figure that out on its own. But OK, so if we sort some of the limits, what can it do? Well, it's very good at processing a huge amount of data and giving human like um, responses based on that data. Um, you know, as, a, uh, as we've talked about already, sort of things like understanding reports, summarizing reports, constructing emails. So it's kind of those, ad, those sort of slightly lower skilled admin type jobs it's really good at. Um, this is something that AI can conceivably do because a kind of, um, you can, a human who is not particularly well trained, if, sorry, if there's a human who doesn't have a huge amount of training can do it. This is something that AI is ripe for, for being able to do. It, it would be remiss of me not also to mention data privacy. If you're using AI tools, so you're using ChatGPT or you know, a bespoke one that someone's built for you, you do need to think through what's the data privacy that's going on here, whose data are we using, um, and make sure that, you know, that you're happy with who's getting this data. Um, but you know, maybe this is a slide we're all after efficiency and innovation through AI. Um, let's have a look. So um, we're going to. This slide is about kind of a, a roadmap from kind of first contact with AI all the way to having your own bespoke tool, um, and we'll, we'll kind of think about that. 
So the, the important thing to think about is if you're kind of stepping onto this road of, of using AI, you know, you want to be a cyborg or a centaur, whichever one it is, um, like how do you go through that process? First of all, you need to be scientists. Um, you know, these, these tools are all very new. We don't really know the limits of them. We don't really know their capabilities. And so, you know, as businesses are considering using AI or maybe already using them at the kind of this sort of enterprise level, you know, rather than just like toys or academic projects, but really using them in business. You know, you are kind of some of the pioneers of using this stuff and seeing what can it actually do? How can it actually help? And so, you know, be a be a scientist. So explore what's out there. OK, there's this large language model. There's that large language model. There's this one. OK, let's compare them. Which are the ones that um, fit our well, fit our needs and then go through a testing period. I mean, hopefully you do this already, um, you know, within your workflows, within your businesses. But if you're introducing a new, you know, a new piece of software, um, AI or not, or, or a new process, you go through a testing phase. AI is no different. You need to test and already know what success from an AI tool would look like, you know, and then reflect on this. You know, these, as I say, these tools are so new that your initial interaction with them might be very negative. It might not get what you're after and those sorts of things. But if you kind of just bounce off it at that point and don't show any kind of robustness within this scientific process, there's potentially a lot that you could be missing out on. You know, reflect, okay, what did work? What didn't work? Okay, well, how can we change what didn't work? How can we do some more research into um, how these tools work so that we can then, you know, the next iteration, the next time we come around to it, we can we can engage with it better because these things are very powerful. These models are very powerful. Remember, you know, that kind of analogy I gave of like the omnicompetent idiot. idiot. You know, we've got to try and get to the omnicompetent bit um, and kind of try and bypass the idiot or kind of guide the idiot. And some of your interactions with them will be frustrating because you'll just end up talking to the idiot. But um, if you can, you know, um, you know, as I say, if you're kind of slightly robust and you know, are willing to kind of reflect and refine what's going on, you will be able to get to this omnicompetent bit and, and get a lot of uh, a lot of power and, um, you know, a lot of speed improvements and kind of efficiency and reliability things from them. Um, OK, so that's the kind of mindset. And then, you know, right now, maybe you're using some of these tools already or there's something that you could just do straight away after this webinar, which is using tools that already exist. You know, I've mentioned ChatGPT, it's a good one, or uh, Anthropics Claude 3, um, very similar to ChatGPT. It's a web interface, you just type into a box and it'll give you an answer. And here's some things you could do it. You know, you've got, um, you know, you've got three long reports and it's kind of a little bit bamboozling. You know, there's quite a lot of technical language that maybe you or someone you're working with doesn't quite understand this is a great thing just pass it to chat gpt draw out you know summarize this can, give me the details about that give me um you know what uh, if you were to boil this down to kind of what this report is really talking about these are good questions to ask of it and it will be able to do it maybe you're as i say we've talked about drafting that carefully worded email drafting emails is something um I use ChatGPT for all the time. You know, I'm not particularly, I'm kind of okay with language, but sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this. You know, you can ask an AI model. I'm kind of wanting to say this, but I wanted to say that instead. And But it needs to sound all a bit formal. Bang, it will be able to produce a really good output for you. Or maybe you're like, oh, I, I just need ideas around, you know, we want a new product that's, um, you know, we want, you know, let's say you're a drinks manufacturer and you're saying, oh, we want a new drink that's, um, you know, it tastes sweet, but it's not as, as high sugar. But, when, you know, we don't want to use these certain products in it. You know, ChatGPT, give me 10 ideas of what we could do. Bang, 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 bang. It'll give them give them to you. Or, you know, your marketing department, oh, we, we're not sure how to, um, their language to use around this new product we've got. You know, so you explain to ChatGPT what this new product is and then say, give me, Give me the, the language we need to be using around this. Give me some, um, you know, maybe even using something like DALI to give you some images to start using. And this is all stuff you can do straight away. You know, you can just sign up and, and get on with it. 
And hopefully as you do this process and you, as you use these tools, you'll come up with some standard ways that you use this stuff. You go, oh, actually, yeah, I'm always, you know, this report that Jenny sends over from, you know, this other business, we, we always have to take this to chat GPT and, and it kind of works, but we could do with something a little bit more bespoke. Ah, that's a point at which to kind of think there's something that we could take here. We've got this, we've, we've identified a workflow where we're already using AI. Is this something that we could then take to, you know, a company like um, Razor or, or um, you know, Tiva and um, and explore? Is this something that we could maybe develop into uh, our own our own product uh, and whether it, it would help? Um, you know, um, and that's where you know you can then start using that uh, retrieval, augmented generation, or embedding that I talked about before, where you're able to start doing things in a really bespoke, um, really bespoke way. Um, I planned to do a lot of talking about this one. This is something that gets me super excited, but um, I'll just, maybe it's just something uh, brief here, but, um, you know, all software tools, you could think of as a sort of three stage thing going on. You have some input data that goes into the software tool and you get output data. You know, it's kind of, it's transforming the input data into output data, input, tool, output. You know, and we're kind of maybe used to this idea, you know, in let's say Excel, you know, we all know Excel, you know, you fill in your sales figures and you're able to get, you, and then you get a sum at the end, you know, that's your output data, the, you know, we've added everything up, um, you know, or your budget, okay, we're able to get the average cost that this is that is costing or you know we're able to get the the percentage of uh costing that is going on materials let's say you know so this is an idea we're used to input data software tool output data now these ai tools what they've done particularly as i say these large language models is they've changed what can the input data and the output data can be you know they still work on this kind of three-step model but they've completely opened up these possibilities so the old, you know, the kind of traditional software tool, the input has to be highly structured. Um, you know, it's kind of a, it's a column of numbers. It's more like what we would traditionally think of as data. But with a new way, the input data can be what well, it can be an image. You know, with your machine learning tool, you can you can pass images and you can get output about your images. Or it can be a video stream, or it could be a conversation, or it could be, you know, a, a uh, you know, I've talked about reports. Uh, it's just because that's what I've been working on recently, so that's kind of in my mind. But um, it can be reports. It can be text from a website. It can be a prompt. Do this for me. And so the the um, we're able to these large language models are able to encode kind of natural language and natural images in a mathematical way, kind of internally. And then able to do normal mathsy things on them, or well, some very sophisticated mathsy things on them, and then convert that back into natural outputs as well. So this is the real power and uh, of what's going on with this kind of AI revolution that we're in the middle of, is that the things that we can feed into our software has just grown massively to all this like natural stuff and this unstructured and things that's laden with kind of human meaning. And the output similarly, you know, we're not just getting a number out, we're not just getting a slightly meaningless rote text, but we're getting genuine meaning um, out um, at the end. So when you're thinking about, you know, engagement with, okay, how in our business can we use AI? Um, think of your old software tools, think about how you use them in your processes, but remember the inputs and the outputs are much, much broader now, and that's what's really kind of going on. Um, this is the QR code for the previous webinar, which was all about innovation. So rather than uh, harping on about um, innovation within your businesses, I, I'm just going to refer you to um, back to that webinar. Um, OK, this is our final section for today, uh, gaining a competitive advantage. How do we actually get ahead of the curve? Um, and, you know, maybe some practical tools. We'll finish on talking about some very practical tools that you, you'll be able to pick up straight away um, to start to start on this kind of journey. Um, and if I could tell you, you know, the roadmap, then 
it wouldn't really be position ourselves ahead of the curve because it's what we'd all know already and so it wouldn't be you wouldn't be valuable um but you need to know your stuff now i'm not necessarily saying kind of you personally but your businesses need people who know their stuff around this kind of thing people who um people who are excited about ai already who are using it in hobby projects some people who understand the maths and the computer science behind the developments that are going on you know so and so's come out with a new model and oh it's like this you need people who understand this space if you don't it's all just going to be a load of jargon and it's it's easy to kind of get confused um so you you need either people within your businesses or you need Biz, or you need partners who really understand this stuff, who kind of live and breathe some of this stuff, who are kind of nerds about this so that they can, you know, kind of translate what is going on and see opportunities within your business. So there, a neural network. Do you know what a neural network is? This is kind of language that's thrown about. You need to know what some of these things are so that, you know, as you look at your businesses, you're able to go, oh, actually, you know, you've got a neural network back in your head and you go, oh, actually, I can see what's going on here. This is where a neural network could help. Or what machine learning is or computer vision or a large language model. So just a couple of, a few moments on each one of these. A neural network, this is the piece of maths that lies underneath all of these AI tools. So this is, um, you could think of it as you've got um, uh, a load of numbers from let's say zero to one, you know, zero, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. It could be um, uh, a, a list of numbers that could be anywhere between zero and one. You've got, you know, let's imagine a, like a big column of them, of these numbers zero to one. And then next week, you've got another column of numbers zero to one. It's maybe as tall, maybe it's smaller, maybe it's wider. It depends on the neural network. And then there are, um, there's a relationship between that first column and that second column. You know, so let's say that the top node of our column here, how does that relate to the top node here? Well, actually, you kind of times it by two to get this one. But actually, this node here has got a relationship to other nodes, other numbers along here. And so you get this very complicated reaction or interaction between these numbers in this first column and, you know, number one in your next column. And once again, you've got this complicated interaction between this column and number number two in your second column and so on to third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. And then, you know, you might have another column and you get a similar thing along. And then at the end, you'll get numbers at the end. Now, that you know, that's just a few seconds of what a neural network is. But hopefully some of that is a bit new. If you, oh, actually, is this a mathematical thing going on where you have these, these numbers that interact with each other to get a new number? And then there's another interaction to get a new number. You know, and these layers can be many, many, many layers to get kind of a numerical output at the end. This is the fundamental math that's behind all of these AI tools. Um, so yeah, there you go. That's what a neural network is. You know, go on YouTube, just type in, you know, uh, beginner's introduction to neural network. It's fascinating stuff. And as you immerse yourself in what's really going on, You'll be able to cut through all the, the jargon and the nonsense and go, oh, yeah, I, I actually understand what's going on here and I can make an informed decision. Machine learning, I've talked about already a little bit. So here, this is where, so that neural network, this is where you're training that neural network with data that you're providing. So, um, you know, there are lots of tools out there that can do this for you, but you're having a, a data set that you're using to construct a neural network um, you know, you're constructing these relationships between the numbers to get outputs at the end. And as I say, this is um, this is ripe for things where you've got a, lo a, uh, a long history of data and you want to make predictions from it. This is where machine learning works. You you have your your data, a model is built off that, and then this model can make predictions. Computer vision. This is, I think, this is where things are going this is a really exciting thing for me you know especially if we think about augmented reality and mixed reality kind of things computer vision is where ai and ar kind of come together um computer vision is where you take images and you train using machine learning techniques you train a model on those images so you're able to recognize things about that image so for example um let's say you've got a You've, you've got a camera feed set up that's watching uh, an employee that has three different workstations. You know, there's a 
there's a, a machine over, you know, let's say we're a manufacturer and we're making widgets, you know, the widget starts off over here, the, um, the employee has to do something here, and then they come to a central bit where they do something, and then finally they do something with it over here. Computer vision is a way of being able to track, oh yes, I know someone's over there, and now they've moved to here, and now they've moved to here, and it can work out the time that it's taking to move between those positions. Large language model, um, it's kind of what I've been ranting on about um, all along, so hopefully you know what that is. Now, finally, some tools to try. We've talked about ChatGPT. Hopefully, this is something you've already know about. But try Claude 3. This is just another thing. It's a, a little bit like ChatGPT, but just by a different company and has um, a larger, what we call context window. So you can give it more information to start with. Um, and so it can process more. Um, or you know, Azure, you know, I, I know a lot of you will have an Azure tendency, you know, going to Azure, set up, set up um, a, an AI um, resource and use OpenAI Studio. It's this kind of really easy uh, interface to interact with, a good place to, to kind of play around with some of the things I've been talking about. Um, you know, and just go and have fun and go, oh yeah, what happens if I try this? What happens if I try this? Um, you know, very similarly, Azure Machine Learning Studio, it's kind of very similar to um, Azure Open AI Studio, but okay, here's some data that, I'm, that I've got, and you know you can play around with it in Azure, Azure Machine Learning Studio, and kind of see the sort of models that you're able to construct yourself with machine learning, um, and then kind of use it to to build some outputs. And you know, it's these are all kind of tools within Azure that have a very nice, well a very easy to use interface. So it's kind of pretty low entry. You know, there's no coding skill that's required to do these things. And finally, Azure have got auto machine learning. This is even easier. Here's some data, click a button, and it produces some things. It's just another fun thing to, to have a play around with. Now, it might be that uh, as you, you play around with these tools, as you think about some of the things I've been saying, you think, oh yeah, actually we, we have already been using AI in our process here, or I think we could use AI here, but you need, you don't have in-house those people who are those kind of those nerds who, are, who kind of live and breathe this stuff. And you, you're wondering, well, how can I get that sort of input? Well, here, this is where the, the TV AI assessment might be able to help, um, might be able to help you, you know, speak to Adam, um, you know, we'll be able to help out, yeah, doing an, uh, an AI assessment, kind of how ready is your business for AI? What are some of the processes that, that we think could be where AI might be able to help. Um, you know, it might be the next step for you on that, that journey to AI maturity. Which leaves me with uh, any questions that you've got? Yeah, we'll just we'll let the, I've actually got some questions for Asia, if that's okay. And just let yeah. the, the audience populate the Q&A section. I don't see anything at the moment. So, um, so, so we, we have a, uh, I've amalgamated a a list of kind of generalized questions that comes from conversations I'm having with organizations around AI in the marketplace, but also uh, a lot of internal colleagues who mm -hmm. uh, who are perhaps new new to the area. So the first question is, in your opinion, are there any specific verticals in industry sectors that would benefit most from some level some level of AI integration at the enterprise level? Yeah, I can think of two particularly come to mind at the moment. So if we're talking large language model type things, any sort of admin task, you know, and kind of who does who isn't doing admin, but uh, administration, this is an area that is really ripe for, you know, uh, AI tools to be used. You know, it's why we created Docky uh, and we're seeing kind of good engagement with that because it's... Um, you're able to have these like bespoke responses to things that are going on inside. Now, why is that helpful? It can just speed up the analysis of um, of text very, very quickly. So rather than having to kind of traipse through lots and lots of um, documentation, you know, let's say there's some new legislation that comes out, rather than having to traipse through all of it and understand all the minutiae, you can quickly get some actionable things out very, very quickly. Um, and start acting upon them rather than having to kind of wade through huge amounts of documentation and, you know, maybe even like getting a dictionary out to even understand what's going on. Um, that's one area. The other area that I see is within within manufacturing. So a lot of manufacturers, 
manufacturers have a lot of data streaming from the machines that they're using already, um, but they don't know what to do with it. You know, they might have been collecting this data for years, but they they don't really know what to do with it. This is the sort of thing that's ripe for machine learning. You know, we can, um, you know, and this is something that Razor have explored is using some of that data to build a model to do things like predictive maintenance. You know, so the, these these models that you can build can be very sophisticated and can spot just slight patterns within, like, let's say one of your machines measures the temperature and it can spot slight changes in the temperature of the machine that indicate, oh, in two weeks time, this is going to need fixing. And so, yeah, within kind of uh, administration, but then also within manufacturing, two different applications, but still kind of this kind of AI core that's that that is, um, you know, I think we'll see in the next few years, lots of people starting to use this and, and getting lots of value from it. Yeah, and I, and I guess administration is applicable really to any organisation, isn't it? <laughs> it's, the, it's the back office function. It's the, the back yeah. office function. So, so in terms of uh, people interacting with AI, and, and and I'm thinking in terms of training requirements or any kind of um, upskilling that needs to be put in place in order to make best use of AI. What are the kind of general best practice or, or the key things to to look out for? The key things to deliver to ensure that that the people themselves are are ready for AI, AI adoption? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think uh, what I would say is making sure that people are kind of ready for any for change. You know, it, it's a well-known thing within organizations that people people fear change, you know, and yeah. um, we can kind of get uncomfortable around it. And I, you know, people, there's already quite a lot of discomfort around AI. And so making sure that, um, you know, employees are prepared for the change in your own structures are in place to to facilitate that that change to using AI tools. But I think um, what I have seen, you know, this is more being in conversations with, um, you know, like my dentist or, you know, like friends of my parents and that sort of thing, but is un really understanding what AI really actually is. Um, so people have very different ideas about really what's going on. You know, there's like a little gremlin sat behind like typing typing away the responses or that kind of thing. But actually, when I've been able to provide just a little bit of knowledge and insight into really what's going on, people seem much more willing both to accept it and then also to play around with it because they see that it isn't, it's not quite as scary as people think it is. Actually, it's kind of underneath, it's just a kind of slightly complicated bit of maths, which, you know, Actually, we've already been using tools like this for, for a long, 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 long time. And it's just like it's the next iteration. Um, so kind of some of what I'm saying there, make sure that people understand what the tools really are doing. You know, give them that bit of insight into kind of go, what's going on behind the scenes. And also make sure that people are prepared for, for changes um, like, like you would with any kind of process change. OK, thank you. And I guess, I guess a personal perspective from you in terms of the implementation of, of AI software, mm -hmm. you know, what, what are the key frustrations or challenges that you come across and, and, and sort of how do you, how do you get around them? <laughs> yeah. Um, a key frustration is the time it takes to develop. Um, weirdly, in software, we used to be able to develop things very, very quickly. Um, you know, um, and this is part of that, det that, because software is determinative in most cases. Here's an input, here's an output. And you can use that as like a little loop to kind of, you know, when you're actually developing, you can kind of go around this loop of like, make this change, what's the output? Make this change, what's the output? Make this change, what's the output? And if you can do that very, very quickly, you know, and software engineers have developed ways of doing that incredibly quickly, um, this is kind of a comfortable way of developing software. If you're developing a tool that interacts with an AI, you've got to wait for the response from the AI to come back. And you've got to, you're kind of at the mercy of some of the limits on what the company that is hosting the AI will put on you. So rather than it just being, you know, three seconds to get your response of like, has this worked for three seconds? Yes, it has or no, it hasn't. Oh, actually, I've got to wait, you know, three minutes for this call to go out, for the response to be generated and for then it to be analyzed by the next large language model. So it's, um, that is kind of a key frustration. And so this brings me back to that um, single responsibility principle. And one of the reasons why I've seen the importance of that is if you, 
when we kind of isolate what it is that the AI is doing, we can then start to speed up that little feedback loop again, because rather than it having to do all these different steps, actually it's just doing this one, um, kind of this actual one function. And so we can um, just test that one little thing again. Um, okay. So yeah, that's okay. kind of some of the ways around it. So, so that's that's thinking about the initial deployment. So that that's interesting. But what about what about the kind of BAU side of things? So you know, so it's, it's deployed. But what about the the approach to maintenance? You know, what what do you need to do ongoing to ensure the continued performance? I guess semi evolution, yeah. and reliability of whatever the whatever the AI software is. Yeah. Um. Good question. Um. Because the the tooling that goes around AI. So you've got the kind of actual AI models, but there's kind of software libraries that can interact with them. Um, these libraries, a bit like AI itself, are developing very, very quickly because this is all still very new. And so the, often these libraries that we're using are adding new features and breaking old features and those sorts of things. So as we're trying to use these tools to develop customer facing products that are actually kind of helpful to people, um, we, we find we're often, often having to navigate those um those libraries and making sure we're using just the correct version that will get this thing in but doesn't break this thing that we've already written um yeah that's something that i hope within the next kind of couple of years will start to settle down some of these libraries have started to kind of come out of beta stage and are proper into kind of here's a release version and so i think some of that will be settling down um and so that will kind of ease some of those frustrations and and so what will that mean kind of you know, for maybe some of the people watching this webinar, it means that, um, you know, development will then become quicker and maintenance will become easier and quicker because this kind of moving target that's kind of within the space will have kind of settled down. So it will be much easier for the for developers like myself to um, to use these libraries uh, to interact with the AIs. OK, brilliant. Thank you, Fraser. So I don't see any further questions. So that concludes the session for those who attended, we will be issuing some feedback forms. So please give us feedback. Uh, your feedback is extremely important in terms of the future sessions that we deliver, in terms of quality and, and some of the topics that we're, we're speaking about. We'll also be in touch with recordings to uh, be, be able to access the webinar recording. Uh, and also we'll be in touch with some further information around the AI assessment, should anyone wish to utilize that. So. I think that's uh, that's everything for today. Thank you for attending and thank you, Fraser. Thanks very much.